GM, GM, just a quick one before we get going. So, as you know, the Blockmates podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Certainly shouldn't be considered as financial advice. We have absolutely no idea what we're talking about half the time. So, any investment decision you do make should be based on your own research and your own understanding of the risks involved. One more thing as well, there's around 50% of people who listen regularly who aren't subscribed yet. So, if you please could just do us a favor and hit the subscribe or the follow button or the like button. Helps content grow, helps us grow helps it reach more people like yourselves um, and it means the world to us as well. So that's the last I'll uh, ask of you. So yeah, let's get to the episode. Okay, we're back. Uh, Darius from Vertex. It's good to have you, sir. You've done a couple of these with us, um, but I haven't had the opportunity to interview you. Uh, Grant's always had that uh, privilege. I've done a couple of spaces with you, but it's really cool to essentially have you in our, in our studio. Um, well, then, yeah uh yeah i mean you guys you guys have had an interesting journey over the last year or so started out with a little bit of an explosion but not one <laughs> heard it was a downward one um so you guys originally were gonna we're gonna build somewhere else tell us about kind of like briefly that journey and and where yeah. you guys are now so originally vertex was going to be this like cross currency trading app on Terra. um rest in peace <laughs> and uh the kind of idea for it was you could come and trade any crypto against any currency and the killer use case was really to do like a multi-currency version of anchor which we thought would be really popular and get a lot of traction and anchor was pretty much the biggest thing in DeFi at that point and so uh, in May last year, we'd raised money a month or two earlier. We were about a week away from Tasnet and Terra blew up. Luna went to zero essentially and UST depegged in spectacular fashion. And so it was one of those situations where the fact that I used to be a trader was extremely useful. We managed to kind of hedge our portfolio so treasury was safe and then when the dust settled we looked at each other and we were like okay well we've built this thing which is essentially like cross margin cross collateralized trading platform super efficient very fast <clears throat> what could we do with this that isn't the original purpose and the way we thought about it was well this would just be useful for pure crypto probably all these old L1s are going to go away to some extent or become much less influential and assets will converge on Ethereum. We know we need to be on an L2 to get the performance we want. And so one thing followed another, we basically decided to move to Arbitrum and build what we're building today. So um, essentially what you see today at Vertex is what we thought it would be you know, 18 months ago um i think what was different 18 months ago is when we first had this idea and started talking to people the question we got quite a lot was this is cool we think it'd be great but uh isn't it just ftx on chain why do you need a version of ftx that's on chain and we were like well you know self-custody see what's going on on chain provable reserves and everyone's like yeah but we've got ftx it'll be fine so obviously, you know, the punchline when things happened in November it was kind of a bit of a light bulb moment for us it was quite fortunate, but <clears throat> we knew we had a product that people wanted. So there's product market fit, which is quite rare in crypto. Um, it then came down to execution. So <clears throat> we launched in April on mainnet. Um, and then we started doing volume since then. And you know, growth curve has been good, very much lower left to upper right, you know. Well, I can't hear you, Jedi, sorry. Um, I think the really interesting thing that you just brought up now is, is the, the product market fit. And I think that, you know, we've seen like a huge influx of, you know, online, well, on-chain, not online, but on-chain DEXs and particularly perp stakes is because obviously there's that that appeal on on the profitability side of it because you know you want to you want to borrow you're going to pay and then you have the opportunity to lend as well which obviously is very appealing from an on-chain perspective but what do you think like the real essence of product market fit 
comes, what is the thing that comes to the fore for you and what Vertex has built that is kind of like stands above and beyond the rest? Because it's it, it just seems like from from obviously having written quite a lot about Vertex over the last year and, and, and kind of like looking at it from the outside in, there definitely does seem to be almost like an exceptional product there. But I'm just curious as to how you guys have managed to find where that exception is uh, from a product market fit perspective. And has it been kind of like a baptism by fire or is it something else that you guys actually sort out in the process, like consciously? Yeah, so um, I think looking back, uh, we all sort of are marked by our biases, right? So I was a trader for a long time. And Alwyn is my co-founder, worked at Jump, um, and a bunch of our team come from a trading background. Weirdly, we had a very clear vision of what we wanted because we just basically built what we wanted a trading platform to look like. Um, I think a lot of derivatives DAXs have been built by people that maybe aren't from a trading background. Um, and so the way they've approached it is maybe from consultation with a lot of retail users. Um, and I think if you look at the end product, what are we really good at? I think if you're a professional trader, if you're someone who works at a prop trading firm, the hedge fund, if you're the sort of person that was doing large size on centralized exchanges, you come to Vertex and it's got all the bells and whistles you're looking for. Where are we a little bit weak? If you're someone who's maybe a very casual retail user and you want something that's super simple UX and UI, um, I don't know that we're quite there yet with those users. We've just kind of gone after like a different segment that to our mind has been quite poorly served by DeFi or derivatives taxes to this point. Our intention is to serve all users, of course, but like, you just can't boil the ocean. So in our mind, it's you've got to go after the guys who do size first. That builds liquidity and activity. Then you can serve the masses. So when you look at our app right now, I would say we are done in what I would call version one. Version one really completes with the token launch, which happens in the next couple of weeks. We can talk about that. But all the basics are in place now. But it's quite complex, but what we can do is we can build simplified UI on top of that. So um, we'll change things where it'll become like you can do isolated margin trades. You can do more of a swap interface. You can have all those things that kind of more retail users want to see. But for now, we're very much oriented at that like super hard end professional guy. And we've seen a lot of traction with those people. Yeah, I think that's that kind of like says it all because a lot of I think just in general, like you find that 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 protocols seek out numbers and like we need followers, we need we need the numbers because that's like really important. And I think that's where perhaps protocols go wrong. Like you've identified where your requirement is. We need liquidity. We need those big wallets to come in and trade and to stick around. I mean, it's all about the stickiness and that's how you do it. Give them a product that delivers, you know, whether it's trading stops, whether it's, you know, like the UI, the UX. And I think that's something that, that we were very interested in from the start. When we first spoke to you guys in the early days, it was like, it was almost like an insisted requirement, you know, within the team, like we've got to get this UX UI thing right. Um, and I mean, I obviously use Vertex and, and, and it is something that you guys have done really well and it keeps on evolving. You're not like, okay, well, it's done and you leave it. You know, it's like it's constantly in its in its motion, in its kind of like, yeah, I really appreciate that about Vertex probably the most. Um, obviously, the most interesting part about it is kind of like how you provide the liquidity. And I know that we've spoken about it in, in a number of articles and previously and I want to just recap on that in terms of, you know, the liquidity and, and obviously making sure that the capital is there, eliminating slippage. You guys have done something very different in this regard. And I'd just like to 
kind of revisit that and tell us a little bit about you know your partners that you brought in and how that whole dynamic works and and why you guys have chosen to essentially access liquidity off chain yeah so um it's kind of a lot to unpack but i think let's go back to what people's normal framework is normal framework of people working in DeFi is that almost religiously everything needs to be on chain and that includes from very top of the stack down to the bottom just everything should be on chain and whilst i have some sympathy for that way of thinking that does lead to some kind of perverse um incentives and structures that don't really make sense to our mind and the number one thing for trading is generally like liquidity right you want to see at top of book or near to it enough bids and offers that you can just execute your size at tiny price so you can just have the risk you want or hedge the risk that you want yeah but <clears throat> because of the way that like amms work or any on-chain action works to do that within block times which are like anywhere from two seconds to 10 seconds depending on like how distributed a chain is and where the nodes are etc you really need to charge quite high fees otherwise the liquidity providers just get run over and this is why when we talk about high frequency trading the reason you want high speed is so market makers can be really confident about showing good liquidity very close to the top of the book you know you want to have that like hundreds of thousands of dollars available to execute, maybe millions of dollars at very close to the touch price. And you can only do that if you can reprice really, really quickly. That involves placing and canceling orders millions of times a day. The problem with on-chain order books or any on-chain action of that sort is every time you place and cancel an order, you have to charge for it. You have to charge gas and that money adds up faster than you can keep reasonable pricing on a limit order book. <clears throat> and so when we built Vertex, we looked at the stack and that goes from like order matching all the way down to order matches now sends on to um, be registered in a book of record and then custody of assets. And really, if you think about it, the Placing and canceling orders is not the valuable part of that. Blockchain is good for like high value things. High value things is recorded transactions and assets. So we put all that on chain. The unvaluable bit, the like low risk piece where you're placing orders, canceling orders, you said, okay, that, that can live off chain. We can build our own sequencer. That can be a trusted uh, centralized point we run. It's all running um and evm so there's no way of us like gaming the orders we never take custody of anything everything's still done by signature then it passes down to chain and clears into our smart contract so um that structure has allowed us to onboard some very large market makers you know um we've gone public with those but you know when to meet people often ask us about but there's a whole bunch of them i think Cellini is public there's a few others as well um we have a lot of market makers in our cap table. So we work closely with like Dexterity, Chain Street, Hudson River, etc. Having those market makers means we can show good liquidity. That means we can do more volume. And then the flywheel persists, right? Because then the more volume you're doing, more value there is an ecosystem. And you see the growth of volumes we've had. It's nothing special. It's just liquidity and volume begets more liquidity and volume. And we've been banging on about this for like, over a year but no one really listened it's only in hindsight then you look back and say well, we did say this like 18 months ago we just keep doing this this will work but you know here we are well welcome to blockmates world that's what we do <laughs> we we like tell people about the likes of vertex and, and many others that really do find that market fit and really think about things <clears throat> carefully and i mean obviously not every single one of them is going to succeed but most of them do, and it's kind of like we told you so. And I think it's really cool that you guys embarked on this mission and, and clearly have delivered um, and really looking forward to this next chapter. And 
I think the obvious question next is, you know, why token? Why this liquid bootstrapping auction? Speak us through that rationale logic in light of the success. It's almost like you guys are seeking more success and, you know, yeah. let's, let's bring it on. Yeah, so the, the token, the thing is, the problem with tokens is there's as many different tokens as there are protocols, right? And they all do different things. And so, like, I think for us, we view this as a reward token, right? And like all rewards, it rewards activity, which we have laid out in our protocol. So uh, market making and market taking. So either you trading and taking liquidity or you're providing liquidity on the order books. So by doing that, we can kind of designate how much people have done within the ecosystem. You know, they can either choose to keep those rewards, they can sell the rewards, it's, that's up to them. But the fact is, <clears throat> over the last six months, what we've done is we said, okay, we'll allocate our airdrop in a very clear way. We didn't want to have one of these, like, trying to gain the airdrop, work things out, blah, blah, blah. We said, no, here's how we're going to do it. Come and trade on Vertex, you will get an amount of token. That means that maybe our airdrop is not to millions of people, but it's to a hardcore thousands of people, right? Who really love the product. They know how it works. They've used it. They've been in it. They see how it functions. But then after like six months of running this program, I said, okay, eventually we've got to put the token out there. So instead of just doing a standard airdrop and letting the price get volatile and our experiences are often community members, particularly like, more retail ones are the ones who get hurt when that happens. You know, they either end up buying something volatile that comes up and goes down or selling on the lows or it's just, there's a lot of tokens change hands and price discovery is messy. We decided to do this LBA, which is like a community driven price setting mechanism. So anyone with tokens can supply to the LBA. Anyone with dollars can do the same. Um, and just organically over the course of a week, a price sets, a pool of liquidity is formed. So we have a pool of liquidity to start. And then the market starts trading and we just see what happens. But instead of getting one of these days, it means that at the start you get one of these days and then the price can do whatever it's going to do up or down. Um, so I think the main thing is for the LBA was that. And then really it's just about creating value for community around that. So for us, we'll have staking for rewards. That's to allow people to show kind of commitment that they want to hold it and keep it longer term. And then we'll just give real yield in the form of, we'll take protocol revenue, we'll disperse some of that to traders and um, protocol hold, like token holders. And there you go, it's fairly simple. Over time, we'll use that as a flywheel. We have a, a lot of other utilities we're going to add, but for the time being that'll be the main one and then we'll just add things as we go yeah i think the the lessons in in the space is kind of like you know what is the the, the first thing is like what is the inflationary aspect of the the token itself or yeah. the reward system itself is there kind of like a only inflationary is does it reach a point where it, where it does become deflationary, what does that dynamic look like at the moment in version one? So I think in version one over the next two years, it's quite inflationary, candidly. Um, but really, that's intentional. And if you think about it, the inflation aspect is a reflection of you're trying to disperse as many of these tokens to as many people as possible over time that the community becomes broader and kind of more uh, decentralized in that in that respect. So <clears throat> getting more breadth to the community is good. Um, it does come with a deflationary aspect, but that deflation is offset by staking rewards, right? So if you're receiving an amount of dollars, you can choose to use those dollars to recycle into buying more tokens or sustaining your stake in the community, or you can just use those dollars and let your ownership percentage deflate. Is it also offset by the fact that we have a staking mechanism which rewards long-term holdings, so you get kind of a multiple. 
I you can hold for six months, get a multiple on how many tokens you're holding, that will counteract the dilution you get from inflation. So there's a kind of, it really depends on how you think about it. And there's like a lot of mechanics we can mess around with in there that um, people can think about from an inflation standpoint. But yeah, that's broadly how we're looking at it. So just kind of like getting into the practical terms of it. So I'm going to, I'm going to seriously consider participating in this event. I decide, fine, I'm going to participate in the event. I'm going to try and find a price that works for me during those seven days. For those of you who don't know how a bootstrapping event like this works, it's essentially the equivalent of a Dutch auction where there's price discovery over a period of time. And you can, you can either, you can, you can sell along the way, can't you, uh, Darius? You guys have that mechanism in place. So the way it works is you can add tokens at any time, but once you add a token, you can't remove it. Okay. Dollars can be added or removed at any point. So okay. what happens is over the course of, this is the first five days. After five days, an equilibrium is found in terms of price. And then there are two days where <clears throat> this kind of buyer's regret. If, if anyone wants to, take dollars out of the pool, they can, and then the price will settle. What you typically find is prices start high, right? Because dollars come in, people are then encouraged to deposit tokens. And then if there's too many tokens, people do some dollars. And generally it like finds a, like the first day or two is kind of volatile. And then it like circles in on a price. And then any stragglers that want to remove their USDC from the pool can. And then it sort of decays to zero and then the price is set and off it goes. So um, that tends to be how they work out. Yeah. We'll, we'll see how this one goes. It can go the opposite direction. It can go, it can do all sorts of things. It really yeah. depends on what suppliers and how you, the community want to do it. But it's one of those things where as like a founder, we've made this decision to put the, process in the hands of the community um and that's kind of where we're at you just got to kind of see what happens and it can be quite fun for people what percentage of the supply are you guys putting within this event <clears throat> so we'll we will incentivize it with one percent of tokens that will be paid out as yield so like that alone makes the yield on it quite attractive okay. um, which is part of what brings the assets in and makes the price fix efficiently and what percentage of the fees will accrue to to that to the guys and the holders that are staking so right now we haven't put like a fixed number on it um we put projection which is like 30 to 50 percent um yeah. go into staking um the balance will be dependent on like where we're at with expenses, how we're growing, what we're doing with other things. So obviously right now we're in this kind of growth phase. So there's a lot of um, expenditure. I mean, we've been relatively disciplined, to be honest, on the expenditure side from development. But then there's other partnerships, building, putting stuff into exchanges, etc., all to cost money. So over time that'll flatten out and what you see is like a more predictable amount of revenue that goes into staking as our plan. So there's a lot of honesty here, like a lot of protocols kind of like, and I don't, I don't think it's because they try and be honest, but I mean, dishonest that they, they, they genuinely like, will put a number up front and they say, normally it's kind of like 50%, but then they start, you know, like seeing how the experiment unfolds and they, kind of like backtrack a little bit goes to governance and the rest of it and then and it, it seems like you guys have got your eyes wide open on this one and it's like okay well we've got a an idea but we can only really determine how that looks like once we've deployed and we've done all these things and we see how essentially this this thing plays out we can sit and theorize and kind of like come up with all these ideas but ultimately we're going to have to like figure it out Kind of like out in the wilderness which is what obviously what you guys are doing yeah um i mean is that the case i mean that's what it seems like and you know what challenges do you guys see you know going forward like what are the things that not necessarily keep you awake at night but like what are the things that you wonder about you know once this goes forward like 
what are those variables that you are considering um, in those quiet moments? Yeah, look, I mean, we try to be as candid as possible with community. I think sometimes that subtlety is lost. I, I understand actually why a lot of protocols try not to translate the subtlety over. It's really difficult. You know, you're dealing with the masses, people get emotional. It's hard to get nuance over on mass. So I think with us, we're trying to be really honest and open so people can see what we're doing, you know, and like as a point of principle, we're all doxxed. We, you know, we show ourselves out to community. People know for better or worse what we're doing. I think the things that keep me awake at night are more, um, maybe more existential to the space. You know, like I spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, we talked about it earlier. It sounds crazy for this to be an existential thing, but UI UX, like using DeFi still sucks. It fucking sucks. Like you got to use uh, setting up a wallet. Like if you sat down with your sibling or your mom, you said, right. Yes, I have. Right. I have. Let's yeah. set up a wallet. About five minutes in, you got a piece of paper. There's 12 words on it. You're telling them about safe. You got to be careful. Maybe get one of these thumb drive things. They're going to just fucking laugh at you. Be like, this is too much hassle. Thank you very much. Bye. Bin. Right. So, if something as simple as the wallet system is so difficult, like we got so much work to do. And I think people are doing great work in account abstraction, thinking about on-ramping and off-ramping, um, thinking about smart ways to do KYC. You know, like KYC is a dirty word in DeFi, but the fact is KYC in TradFi stops bad people using the financial system to wash their money, right? Um so there are lines of how do we do this? And the, the industry is working. There are people doing good things in this space, trying to fix all these problems. But I worry that, like, you know, what happens vis-a-vis -vis regulation, engagement, blah, blah, blah. And generally, if the Bitcoin price goes up, it's very helpful to the rest of the space in developing all this stuff. So the recent rally has been good and has probably given me a few more well-rested nights as we can look at the market and say, okay, we're seeing good growth now. Interest is getting back up. You know, it makes things easier. It makes it easier to solve hard problems is maybe the right way to put it. Challenges, challenges that you guys have faced that you've managed to overcome. Oh, fucking hell, man. I mean, everything. Uh, yeah. Terror blowing up. Um, you, we had to lay off most of our team after that and then rebuild, um, FTX blowing up, you know, we had to make sure all our assets were in order. You know, luckily we didn't have anything on centralized exchanges as a point principle, USDC depegging USDC is our like major treasury currency, as well as the thing that we keep our accounting in on Vertex. Um, and that's just broader macro shit that happened as well as you know regulatory environment is tough and then we have the usual stuff of building a project launching a protocol worrying about you know does all your tech work when it's put under massive strain but and yeah i mean you know combination of i think we've been very smart with certain things other things there's been some luck uh there's been yeah it's been a rocky road over the last 18 months, two years. You know, the original idea I had for Vertex was over two years ago. So we've gone from two years ago being an idea about how could you do a multi-currency version of Anchor to two years later, this multi-collateral, cross-margined, high-speed DAX. Um, so yeah, it's been... It's been a journey. Love that summary. Like I wanted to bring you on today to to summarize this this journey of we intended to do X, we went about doing it through a process of Y, and this is what the future looks like. And it's that was a beautiful summary. Definitely going to get a clip of that one and I put it out there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that's what we enjoy about 
what we do is to see that growth within the space with with protocols and individuals and and then to to see like you know does it make them a better version of themselves at the start versus where they are now and i think vertex is definitely a better version in terms of what we've seen um and i think the 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 challenge is always going to be to maintain that level you know like this is what we set out to do and and I think in many ways that's also quite difficult, you know, like like how do we put something out there that's really cool and, and works and then to maintain it, you know, like I think GMX is a very good example of of some something that, that was really innovative at the time, obviously the yeah. dynamic with GLP and and all the rest of it. But I, I almost feel like they reached a point in that evolution where they really needed to go back and look at like what was the essence of what it is that we did at the beginning? And they had to, I think they had to, I mean, I'm not entirely sure whether this is correct, but I almost feel like they had to almost go back to their roots, um, you know, with this version two and, and look at how we're going to like kind of tap into that, that excellence that we had before, because I almost felt like they almost lost it a bit. And, you know, obviously the bear market didn't do anyone any favors, but at the same time, bear markets do, kind of expose you know who's not wearing their shorts on that low tide and i think the yeah and i think in many ways like like gmx was tested along those lines i think they've they've sorted it out um and it's going to be really interesting to see how version two plays out for them in this next cycle and you know you guys have the advantage that you kind of like did it when you were in the trenches and you were covered in mud so you were just forced <laughs> to figure it out um, anyways, that's my little rant about kind of like the context of like, what do we want to do? How do we do it? And how do we actually like get it right? Um, and it's going to be yeah. really interesting to see, which is my next question. What does version two look like? Like when you think about, you know, besides the UI UX improving upon those things, like, you know, is it about cross chain? Is it about bringing other forms of collateral within the mix? How does your version two look like? Yeah. So. I think when we launched, going back to kind of mistakes we've made, good things and bad things, I think Alwyn and I were really taken with this idea of like cross margin, cross collateral, everything, just make it all work and go for it. And then as we've grown, you know, obviously we thought we could be successful. I think it's been more successful quicker than we thought it could be. You know, we've really grown very quickly what's become very clear when we speak to users is if we want to go bigger, <clears throat> we need to start listing more products. So way more um, perp markets, way more spot markets. And the challenge with that is with spot, you're kind of constrained by the liquidity of the tokens you have on a given chain. So coming up with a way to embed more spot markets using a cross-chain messaging protocol or something is becomes really important but then also our risk system is such that the more products we add the more complex it gets for the risk engine to calculate what it needs to do in real time and for a lot of those products especially the like long tail assets People want to trade them, but I don't think they are really expecting cross collateral or cross margin for trading like Pepe or trading like a Rollbit future, right? What they want is they just want to get exposure on an isolated basis. They'd be more than happy with that. And actually that would make the risk engine way simpler. So we could do way more scale. We could build to hundreds of thousands of products and that weakness has become clear to us as we've grown so like one of the things we talk about is how we add that in the next iteration so that's kind of like we have this like version one complete i'm going a bit down the technical rabbit hole but basically what i'm saying is how do we go from being a dax with like 40 to 50 products on it to being an exchange that just happens to be on chain that has like a thousand products on it and keep all the things that were super good about this first version in the second version. That's the next leap. That's how we go V2. And that's where you become, you adding all those things on top, like the account abstraction, the on-ramping, off-ramping, you know, you think about how you deal with regulatory stuff 
in an intelligent way? How do you add all those things that then it feels like, oh, it's an exchange. It just happens to be on chain rather than it's a DEX and you've got to do this stupid wallet thing and get it on chain and run money around and you know what I mean? So that's saw... version two. That's version two also can't put kind of like the on and off ramp at ease and eliminating those pieces of paper. Is that something that you guys are focused on or is that not kind of a priority at the moment? Because I, I know that that's a difficult one. That is another can of worms. Yeah, look, it's... It's all about noble aims, right? And it's an iterative process. So when you say version two, you know, I don't know if you, my first introduction to version control was Windows, right? When I was a kid, like 3.1, yeah. 3. Point whatever. And then they go, they jump a thing, right? I would say we're on version like 1.7 of Vertex now. What we aim for in Q1, Q2 is how do we jump to version 2.0 and evolve that over the course of a year to be complete. So at the end of that, yeah, we, we hope that would be something we could add, but you don't know until you meet those challenges and where the features get added. We'll see. Great. Um, I think we've done really well in terms of our chat today. I'm really, really looking forward to this event that's happening next week. So we're recording this on Thursday the 9th. I think we're going to publish it probably on, on Monday. And you guys are running your event next week from today, obviously. Um, that's a seven-day process. Looking forward to that. Uh, I'm really interested to see what's going to happen in the event. Every single uh, bootstrapping event that we've seen over the last eight months been relatively successful and then it's been down only and i think with what the market's doing right now i'm going to go on record and say that it's going to be up only for a while um and if it does then i'm going to buy myself a bottle of tequila because i'm definitely going to be participating not financial advice and all that jazz <laughs> um, <laughs> but it will be interesting to see i think you know that's that this might be like a major event that i think we'll see a turn in what the market's doing not only like you know charts going up but a, an event that is obviously there to fund and incentivize community and it'll be interesting to see if it does go up and i think it will um last thing before we leave what inspires you in this space presently it can be more than one thing if you'd like um well look i think you know you mentioned other perp taxes i think you know we looked at people like DYDX, GMX, Mango Markets, Per Protocol. These were all like innovators in the space in different ways, right? And they they were quite they've been quite an inspiration to us in terms of building our own business. So like props to those guys for breaking new ground. I think I've been <clears throat> very surprised at um, just how many people stuck around during this winter um and so it's just a general like that community aspect has been quite inspiring i know it's a word that gets bandied around but for all the dicks sort of trolling people on twitter etc there's at least another person that is being positive and trying to research and keeping an interest in what's going on and I like interacting with those people. So when you go to conferences or you meet people in real life, I found that inspiring, you know, like going to East Denver last year or various other things I've been to, like they've been quite inspiring events. Yeah. Nice. I like that. I like the fact that you look at the, the competition and say, you guys inspired us and, you know, we, we want to better that and further that. And yeah, I agree with you. I think the fact that so many people stuck around and, I think a lot of good friendships have developed over this last, especially the last 12 months. Um, and I think also I'm very much inspired by that as well. So thanks, yeah. Darius, for joining us. Uh, it's been really cool to finally meet you and, yeah. and chat essentially in person. I mean, I look forward to meeting at, at hopefully one of the conferences in the next 12 months and obviously off the back of, of more success. And yeah, just keep on doing what you guys are doing. It's great to see and yeah, really, really appreciate your time. I know that you're super busy. And yeah, you're welcome anytime. And I'm sure we'll get you back on at some point post this launch and chat about this again. Uh, thanks, man.
I appreciate it. No, of course. I have to come down to South Africa, come and watch some rugby or something. Yeah, man, that will be an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Um, it's such a shame they won't let us host one. But uh, yeah, it'll be good. Yeah. Cool. Good Take it easy, Darius. Really man. great to have you on, man. Yeah.